hello to the third lecture in our series, Feminisms in the Digital Age, Transnational Activism in Germany and Beyond. My name is Maria Stele and I'm from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, my talk today follows the first two talks um, that I think laid the um, kind of laid out the general context in which we want to see this work and kind of the um, socio-political issues at stake very nicely. And uh, my talk today is the first part of our discussion of awkward activism. Uh, that discussion will continue next week with um, my collaborator and friend um, Carrie Smith Price talk. Um, so what you just saw in the clip is from a video made by Peaches, um, who's a Berlin-based artist and musician. This song was put together uh, partially based on an online call for participations um, on the Facebook page of the group Riot Girl Berlin, calling on Pussy Riot supporters to join in on creative action. And this call reads in part, whether you are in Berlin or anywhere in the world, Peaches and Simone Jones are writing a free Pussy Riot song tomorrow and shooting a video for it on Wednesday. If you are in Berlin, show up, dress as your best bad self, march down the street and in the park with us singing Free Pussy Riot. And then it continues, if you're not in Berlin or can't make it, please send a 30 second video of yourself showing support by dancing, jumping on your bed, breaking shit, laughing, holding a free, free Pussy Riot sign, etc. and send us a link to your video. We will edit this on the weekend and get it out into the world by Monday. Such immediate Western cries of support for Pussy Riot were only possible because Pussy Riot's protest actions, the documentation of their arrest, trial and imprisonment, their songs and manifestos, and in general, their image, the now ubiquitous colorful balaclavas, were geared towards transnational digital dissemination. The very evening following Pussy Riot's performance in Moscow's Cathedral of Christ the Savior, the performance that led to the arrest of three members of the group and thus the start of their international recognizability, a video of the performance entitled Punk Prayer, Mother of God Chase Putin Away had been, pro had been produced and distributed via online platforms. A similar process of instant dissemination enabled the creative responses to Pussy Riot's arrest in Western feminist communities, the initiatives Free Pussy Riot, the wearing of balaclavas in solidarity, the printing of posters and statues, poetry collections that were digitally sold, like Poems for Pussy Riot, or as this call for contributions above illustrates music videos. Free Pussy Riot then not only became a political catchphrase, but it also symbolized the acknowledgement of and participation in the global power of pop feminist protest art in the age of technology. Based on this viral global spread of Pussy Riot's videos and the associated political messages, the makers of the award-winning documentary film Pussy Riot, A Punk Prayer um, that aired on HBO in 2013 claimed that Pussy Riot is the most successful art performance in history. As a result of their success, which is defined by Pussy Riot's ability to, to inspire and motivate other people to protest on a global scale, a range of issue arises. Um, arise. The exact points of political intervention of Pussy Riot feminism remain murky. The group insists that Pussy Riot's art is anti-capitalist, but it might be difficult to uphold this claim in the context of their global consumption. What further complicates any analysis of the political context of Pussy Riot feminism performance or feminist performance protests are the global travels of the nationally specific message of their political activism, which is the critique of what they see as a patriarchal Putin dictatorship in alliance with the Orthodox um, Church in Russia. Finally, the most um, recent division in the group's unity around feminism itself following the circuit of two of its members, um, Nadia and Masha, to discuss their experience of imprisonment and to advocate for change in prison conditions and more generally to promote human rights. The phenomenon of Pussy Riot indicates a shift in the economy of global circulation of art and protest movements. Their political message travel 
uh, political messages travel through digital spaces, urban streets, local media, and different national contexts, but the content of that message is unstable. The example of Peach's call to Pussy Riot supporters introduces a number of elements essential to our discussion about awkwardness. Feminism, protest performance art, digital communities, and participatory politics, but also circulation, transformation, consumption, event culture, mis mistakes, and mishaps. Such large-scale feminist activism today depends on popular culture in the form of digital culture, becoming as much a consumer-based participatory event as a political action. The digital is, par is part of the activist performance, even in or as critique. At the same time, contemporary feminist activism references its historical roots by replicating the form and content of pre-digital feminist protest movements, including the political valuation of bodies and an emphasis on DYI aesthetics and performance, very clearly seen in the video. The transnational reach of feminist activism through digital circulation does not mean that the local is drained from the protest message. Instead, the local rears its head in strange and uncomfortable ways. In our research project, Carrie Smith Pry and I rethink not only the way feminist performances, protests, and activisms work in the digital age and how they in turn rewrite the digital economy, but also how contemporary feminism as an ethos must be rethought for the 21st century. We explore the urgency of political of feminist politics today, but not in a matter, matter that is measurable by, by its success or failure on numerous issues standard to feminist analysis. Instead, we identify a current circularity in feminist creative work and activism that we describe as awkward. Awkwardness does not necessarily or only radiate from a single performance or protest event, but emerges in new forms of dissemination and reception, particularly in the multimedia circulation of such events. It thus also includes audience, medium, and form. Such circulations are awkward in that they are enabled by a neoliberal digital economy, but simultaneously reveal the false promises of neoliberal capitalism. They do not or cannot detach from the economy that enables them. Rather, they stick to them in an uncomfortable, awkward manner that contains the suggestion that there must be different modes of life, connection, and community outside of the consumption patterns and identity stylings that drive neoliberal economies. Awkwardness also describes the politics as aesthetic form of becoming, of defiance, and of disruption. In this sense, our readings of feminist protest events in the digital age suggest that exploit, exploiting, using, and keeping with the awkward is a made of, mode of politics. In our initial attempts to tackle the question of feminist politics in the 21st century, we stumbled upon the term awkwardness, and it stuck with us. The word, a combination of word as a term to describe motion, and of awk, which comes from Middle English meaning backwards, perverse, or clumsy, describes a misdirected motion, maybe a motion that cannot be controlled or initiated, the non-chronological, the multidirectional. Awkwardness messes with timing and with the timeline. It messes with space and location, moving in and out of visibility and in and out of the digital. Awkwardness can also be intentionally provoked emotion. Looking at the, internationally, at the intentionally awkward allows us to approach our questions with a playful and performative, self-conscious sense of agency. Our methodology is formed by our own histories of feminist activism and academic feminist engagement, by our struggle with and thinking about new forms of political activism, and grounded in recent feminist and affect theory. In both respects, in our personal histories and in our theoretical engagements, awkwardness is simultaneously coincidental and intentional.
This production of unclear political meaning speaks to the situation of contemporary feminism in popular discourse and potentially in the academy, which makes feminism palatable through words such as post-feminism or lifestyle feminism. And we've heard some of the theorizations behind that in the previous talks. An alternative term specific in its use to Germany that came out of these discussions is pop feminism or pop feminismus. Pop feminism instead evokes feminist traditions of creative work, particularly performance art since the 1970s, but also points to their failures in today's context. It is a reaction to both second wave feminist political tradition and contemporary depoliticization of feminism. In particular, it uses feminism to decode, but uh, recode pop culture and pop to rewrite feminism. First theorized by Sonia Eismann in the edited volume Hot Topic, Pop Feminismus Heute, Pop Feminism Today, pop feminism provides a feminist approach to pop culture, but it also critiques and redefines both feminism and pop culture. Popular culture should be perforated and rocked by feminist strategies. Eismann's attempt to reclaim feminism for a new generation is on the one hand a reaction against the popular understandings of feminism in Germany as second wave feminism, and on the other hand a correction of the radical voice missing or a reinsertion of politics drained from the post and lifestyle feminism. But while pop feminism is a playful politics of personal experience taking to a theoretical level, it is constantly and consciously in danger of becoming an object of consumption, for it uses pop culture on a global scale to look for local spaces of change and resistance. I will now focus on two main examples to develop our pop feminist approach. The work of feminist music, performance, fashion design, and art collective Chicks on Speed, and the performances of the Turkish-German porn rapper, sex activist, actress, and author Rehan Shaheen, with her stage name Lady Bitch Ray. As these laundry list descriptions of both artists illustrate, neither is easily described or contained within just one descriptor. They share certain elements, but also work rather differently, which allows us to sketch out the range of political awkwardness in pop feminist work. Both examples are positioned at a moment of transition between activist forms of the early 21st century and new forms of activism that developed with Occupy, Pussy Riot, and Femen protests. The band and artist collective Chicks on Speed is a pop feminist performance group that explicitly understands their work in the context of feminist performance art and as part of a global political feminist culture from the beginning in the late 1990s until today. Their music, performances, visual art, and DIY fashion is infused with the idea of the political project of feminism. In their works, they fight for feminist body politics. But both their geographic location and their political position are complicated and have certainly shifted since the 1990s. Fittingly, a statement on the back of the 2010 book and exhibition catalog, Don't Fashion Music, Don't Art Fashion Music, tries to preempt any attempt to clearly define their politics and that it, quote, highlights the pitfalls of defining their practice or attempting to freeze the meaning of their contemporary work. Chicks on speed are self-consciously and intentionally awkward. Their approach is postmodern and deconstructive and they explicitly attempt to make political pop feminist art. Their art, however, is mainly received as part of an urban, middle-class, hipster, subcultural movement rather than as a broad political intervention. What further muddies their political intervention is the fact that over the course of more than a decade-long career, 
the reception of their performances and the political moments that surface in this reception process undergo various shifts. In the later 2010s, for example, their work has entered the museum spaces around the globe, really. Lady Betray, <coughs> excuse me, Lady Betray is the stage name of Rehan Shahin. Shahin also holds a PhD in linguistics from the University of Bremen, where she completed her dissertation on the semiotics of clothing, and she now holds a research position in media and communication at the University of Hamburg. She first appeared in public as Lady Betray after launching a lawsuit against her former employer, Radio Bremen, for firing her based on her online appearances in May 2006. She approached the German tabloid paper Die Bildzeitung with her story and due to the scandal appeal of a highly educated Turkish-German porn rapper, the paper gladly published her story. In the following months, Lady Betray became a short-lived media phenomenon. While her record label and line of clothing are entitled Vagina Records and Vagina Style respectively, thus um, connoting female sexual empowerment, um, her lyrics are riddled with anti-female um, words and language that retain much of their violent impact. Lady Bitch Ray's uneasy approach to female agency is central to her performances, including also interviews and talk shows where she physically embodies typical aspects of heteronormative erotic fantasy and visually cites pop pornographic expectations of objectified desire, all the while expounding her own brand of feminist ideology. Until the release of her book in 2012, all her work, moreover, is digital and therefore mobile. It can be downloaded, it's fleeting, it could be removed or buried in cyberspace, and it's manipulatable um, in comment sections and so forth. At first glance, and in contrast to um, Chicks on Speed, her awkwardness appears much less intentional and was often mainly uh, described mainly by mainstream media as an unwanted effect. The two examples, both pop and both feminist, in different but distinctive ways, illustrate the breadth and complexity of political pop feminist awkwardness. Body politics play out differently in the two examples, mainly since Lady Betray's work is racialized, and also because their engagement with technology and the digital takes very different forms, and their local global location produce very different kinds of circulations. In both cases, though, we argue that we can locate political interventions by tracing the complex circulation of images, narratives, and meanings that are both digital and physical. Our starting points for analyses are the fleeting and slippery nature of the digital and the performative, and then integral to that, the complex overemphasis and marginalization of the body. Both of these aspects are crucial for a political understanding of awkward moments in pop feminist pr protest performances and the technologies of gender they produce. The allusion to Teresa de Laurentiis' groundbreaking text, Technologies of Gender, is here intentional. In Technologies of Gender, de Laurentiis sees gender as a product of various social technologies with reference to academic discussions and social and cultural practice. According to De Laurentiis, the representation of gender is its construction, with which goes on as busily today as it did in earlier times. Gender as a discursive constructions, construction via a flurry of representation means that gender categories are also defined by their deconstructions, by feminist discourses that question what they see as gender norms and by any excess of its representation, by ruptures, destabilizations, or political trauma. Technologies refers to that mechanism of construction which facilitates a crossing of the theoretical with the practical. Both material bodies and the digital work as technologies that communicate the place where practice and theory collide. While discussions of the body and new te technologies have long been standard to feminist theoretical vocabulary, and we're thinking of Donna Haraway here, of course, little headway has been made into the theoretical and practical impact digital mobility has made 
on transnational and local feminist body politics in protest performance art, in part, we suggest, due to the difficulty of articulating the political in pop feminism and the attendant affective appearances of awkwardness. Our theorization of awkwardness is based on a number of thinkers who have, in a variety of ways, attempted to engage with the circularity of the political with specific reference to feminism. Common to these thinkers is the understanding that that which potentially defines the possibility of the political is also that which undoes it due to its reliance on neoliberal mechanisms. We rely heavily on the concept of cruel optimism of the contemporary neoliberal moment as outlined by Lauren, Lauren Berlant in 2012. In this study, Berlant writes of the optimism produced by the neoliberal promise of the so-called good life as follows. <clears throat> and you see the quote on the slide. Optimism is cruel when the object or scene that ignites a sense of possibility actually makes it impossible to attain the expansive transformation for which a person or a people risks striving. And doubly, it is cruel insofar as the very pleasures of being inside a relation have become sustaining regardless of the content of that relation, such that a person or a world finds itself bound to a situation of profound threat that is at the same time profoundly confirming. Cruel optimism, therefore, is the continued belief that success is on the horizon if only this or that object is attained or seen experienced, the object or seen being precisely that which stands in the way of attaining the promised success. The object or seen of cruel optimism can be love, the desire for the good life, or the wish for the political, including, of course, the feminist political. We are thinking here also in a larger project about um, other theorists like Jack Halberstam or Sarah, uh, Sarah Ahmed, of course. So pop feminism is subject to the manner in which pop, both feminist politics and pop culture are reliant upon neoliberal mechanisms, even as they're radically rewritten, manipulated, leveraged, or clash in pop feminist performances. Berlant's concept of cruel optimism offers us a way of defining this ambivalent position as political. Pop feminism is a form of cruel optimism. Feminism creates a relation, or in Berlant's word, an attachment that contains promises such as liberation from oppression, freedom or freedom of oppression, choice of sexuality or economic equality. The object is the wish for the political that promises clarity of meaning, of goal and intent, and productivity, meaning the binary of success and failure. The attachment, though, lasts only due to the fact that the promises are not yet fulfilled. Conversely, pop culture, including media, creates an attachment based in consumerism that promises global belonging through participation. Pop feminist actions are found or consciously place themselves in the middle of such relations that uphold cruel optimism. However, they also engage with and exploit the assumptions that underlie these relations. To begin with, feminist causes remain at the center of their narratives, but emotional attachments are mainly formed by a critical negativity to these causes. Furthermore, Objects of popular consumption are also at the center of the story of protest, but negative emotions and critical negativity vis-a-vis -vis these objects emerge as the primary point of the performances. Pop feminism makes visible cruel optimism because it openly uses feminist and neoliberal attachments and positions itself negatively against them. As such, pop feminism refuses to accept conventional understandings of success or failure as key to the feminist project, nor is it evaluative in its consumption or coding of neoliberal pop. Awkwardness emerges in the circularity, and it is in theorizing this awkwardness that we read the complicated and precarious position of the political. Berlant, in her conclusion to Cruel Optimism, writes about the current political moment as a moment of transition where something is threatening to detach from what is already not working. 
a concept that we use throughout our work. Our search for awkwardness allows us to stay with this threat or to linger in that moment of transition. It is crucial to understand the politics that emerge in this moment of transition to understand what eventually might come out of this moment, if anything ever comes out of it. A related spatial metaphor um, that we're also using in our discussions is the notion of circularity, of moving in circles, where one constantly moves away from something only to return to the point of origin. In such circularity, detachment is also not happening even though it is a constant present threat that is articulated over and over again, circularity. The threat of detachment is lingering, but whatever might be on the move stays awkwardly attached. There is no clear sense that this detachment will ever happen, so rather than focusing the political attention to the goal on what might happen, we are interested in the current moment, in the formulation of this threat. Frau Dr. Betray, Frau Dr. Betray, Sie müssen wieder anfangen zu rappen, sonst kackt die deutsche Rap-Szene voll ab. I'm now coming to my third and final part of this talk today. Um, where I'm returning to the examples of Lady Betray and Chicks on Speed that offer two different kinds of framing or reframing bodily awkwardness in the neoliberal age and in the digital realm. They make the legacy of sex-positive feminism and feminist performance art awkward by engaging with feminist body explorations and performance practices as they meet with either um, among other mainstream discourses, pop porn mainstream in the case of Lady Betray, or with pop hypermediality in the case of Chicks on Speed. Both artists use concepts of performativity that are rooted in the feminist politics of the 1970s and 80s, but the concept of provocative performativity dissolves and evolves into disruptive awkwardness as it clashes with a neoliberal cultural sphere. A way in which both examples illustrate this is by becoming too much or too outrageous or too outraged. The bodies are too close, too sexual and too intimate as well as too mediated, too intermediate or too glossy. These seemingly hard to combine elements of too much, which are nonetheless rather easily consumed and marketed in a neoliberal economy, are then counted with acts of disappearance. Before she published the book, for example, Lady Betray left the public media stage as a performer only to reappear on the glossy pages of her own hedonistic book in um, overexposed poses, and um, this is her book, Bitchism. Chicks on Speed's performances are improvised and fleeting, and their stage is constantly on the move to different centers of hip art and subculture venues from street protests to museum spaces. Their danceable pop performances merge into hard-to-consume, loud and long multimedia spectacles. Chicks on Speed are slipping away from appropriation also by the way in which political interpretations of their art shift in light of, for example, the actions of Pussy Riot. Similarly, Lady Betray's politics grow and get crushed as discourses around race, sexuality and Turkish-German women in Germany shift. In the German context, Lady Betray is racially other and often received as speaking mainly about and for sexually, mainly, oppressed Muslim women. This places her in the middle of a messy political discourse that Rehan Shahin both uses for and, most importantly, deconstructs in her work. Mainstream media tried to for example, to cast her as the westernized liberator of oppressed Muslim women, a role she played outrageously well, which in turn deconstructed it. While she used this mainstream approach to her work to get publicity, she positioned herself against the white male gaze and aligned herself with Muslim and Turkish women in Germany. In the headscarf debates, for example, which is also a topic of her academic work, Rehan Shahin clearly positions herself as a voice for and of women who do not who do not choose to wear the headscarf, but also for women who do. 
Her provocations as Lady Betray then are always meant as provocations for the mainstream discourse that targets minority women as either oppressed or sexualized or both. This circularity is what describes, to return to our metaphor, the notion of detachment and reattachment, the constant references to discourses, in this case, mainstream porn, racialized eroticism, German racism and sexism, and offers moment of political, moments of political critique that remain firmly attached to their objects of critique at the same time as they disrupt and disturb these very discourses. In a similar circular motion as Lady Betray, Chicks on Speed's art and music constructs and self-deconstructs. The politics of their circulations are more self-referential and, at least seemingly, much more controlled than in the case of Lady Bitch Ray. Chicks on Speed are globally accessible, albeit to a rather small artsy subculture. In their art, Chicks on Speed play with different notions of attachment. Our analysis reveal the fleeting and often seemingly accidental and spontaneous moments when their work rather awkwardly detaches or threatens to detach from what is not working just to return to Berlant's concept. Awkwardness works intentionally and unintentionally in Chicks on Speed's self-ironic staged polished DYI performances. The ironic self-referencing simultaneously highlights and crushes the political effects of their performances. Both Lady Betray and Chicks on Speed are polished performance artists who make music and fashion design and who work with multimedia platforms. However, Lady Betray's awkwardness counts on a public political discourse. In contrast to Chicks on Speed's rather abstract references to political issues, her work is political in an immediate and interventionist way, mimicking the fast-paced comment section of digital social media and news sites. Her political impact is bound to media events and discourses. This might be the main reason why Lady Betray's work does not travel or at least has not yet traveled beyond the German context very much, at least not with the political messages she carries within the German media landscape. In spite of her extensive references to mainly US um, American female rap and hip hop artists to the state, her political interventions are located in a national context. In both examples, however, the circular productions of political awkwardness are intimately and awkwardly closely linked with a sexualized body. The performances of Chicks on Speed and Lady Betray reveal that the staging of sex as pleasure is a cruel optimism in that they continue to promise fulfillment and intimacy that they cannot and do not want to offer. What this mechanism generates, however, is a kind of playful and joyful awkwardness that escapes the logic of cruel optimism. In her performances, Lady Bertrand instrumentalizes race and fashion to enable and enact an oppositional political economy of the body, which animates the material realities of race, gender, generation, sex, and class that frame the digital and real production and consumption of fashion objects, images, and knowledge. And this analysis is also based on Min Hao Fang's um, discussion of uh, blogs and fashion. The kind of animating of material realities of race, gender, and sex is not accurately described as simply performative, but it becomes political by highlighting the relationships between bodies, race, and consumption. Schicks on Speed's performances illustrate this playing field of the political differently. While race is a blind spot in their art, they manage to draw close attention to normative bodies by animating the normative body as awkward or awkwardly. By staying with them, by staying too close to them and dancing around, around them, these bodies, they joyfully deconstruct gender and beauty norms. By, by moving their work mainly into art spaces, chicks on speed, protect their work from a certain kind of appropriation by the neoliberal pop culture market, but at the same time, they subject their art to another kind of high culture appropriation that strips their work of politics by making it exclusive and deeming it too artsy for the mainstream public. By detaching from pop cultural counter public and attaching themselves to the museum and art spaces, Chicks on Speed escaped a certain kind of pop appropriation by replacing it with the threat of becoming an exclusive and artsy museum piece. 
Sometimes, though, and this is precisely what interests us in this project, political moments come from unexpected directions. The fact that Pussy Riot performances are reminiscent of Chicks on Speed's earlier gigs reinfuses Chicks on Speed's work, for example, with politics. Yet again, this refocuses our attention on the pop feminist circularity. Our argument does not attempt to answer the question of whether the work of Chicks on Speed or Lady Betray is or is still political or not. We hope to tease out how, at various moments, it makes political interventions. Rather than as provocation, we describe these moments as, however playful, disturbances. And I'm going to end here for today, and uh, Carrie will continue these discussions in her talk next week. Thank you.